This is the untold story of the dramatic rebirth of the downtown of a great American city, Providence, Rhode Island. It's a story seen through the eyes of many of the major participants, architects, once the renewal began, preservationists, what would be getting created here was a place for people to come to. Politicians. And that's why Providence is what it is. Private developers. The reception was quite positive. And architectural said, historians. This is the capital. Who have studied and celebrated the city's remarkable urban fabric. And as seen through the camera lens of Salvatore Mancini, a celebrated photographer who has chronicled the city's decline and transformation. Providence was a city founded at a propitious location, at the confluence of three rivers, which flowed into the head of Narragansett Bay. When Roger Williams arrived here, fleeing persecution in Massachusetts, he arrived, fittingly, by boat. Because for the settlement that became Providence, water was to be its lifeblood. It was a very uh, rich and fertile landscape in terms of resources, which uh, the Wampanoag and the Narragansett, who were the tribes that principally were in this area, made use of. One of the things that makes Providence special, I think, is its situation on both a river, or rather a confluence of two rivers, and on the ocean, but not directly on the ocean, but at the end of a long and very protective bay, if you like, Narragansett Bay. And so the city from its very beginning, as a result of this geographical location, was connected internationally. For the colonists, there was an additional benefit. The Blackstone River just north of Providence was fast moving with a rapid descent, and its power could be harnessed. In the 1790s, Knowledgeable people saw what was happening in Great Britain where they had developed a new use for water power on a larger scale, operating what we now call factories, but places of mass production in which machinery is taking raw materials and turning it into a finished product at a high rate of production. Every Rhode Island school child knows the outlines of the story, how Samuel Slater essentially stole the process from the British and together with Moses Brown, set up shop, and Providence's future direction was set. The kind of mill that he demonstrated was then replicated by imitators up and down the Blackstone, up and down the Patuxet, and Providence, which was a center of, of merchant capital at the time, all of a sudden became the financial center of the uh, country's first large industry textiles. To facilitate the continuous movement of manufactured goods from factories along the Blackstone River to Providence, a canal was built. Well, Blackstone River Canal really came a little too late because it, it came right as the railroads were starting. And so it was eclipsed by the railroads almost immediately. But in Providence, there was relatively little water power. There weren't very many factories in Providence originally because in the 1790s, um, you needed uh, rapidly flowing water. It really wasn't until the development of steam power, which was really pushed along in 1848 by a young inventor who came to Providence named George Corliss, who developed a new type of valve for steam engines that made them much more efficient. And consequently, manufacturing 
no longer had to go to the waterfall to get its power. And that really triggered Providence becoming a manufacturing city. It grew from a town to a city in a very fast rate, driven by textiles. In Providence, you had a range of things. And as a consequence, there were a variety of industrial buildings that got built throughout the city. Some of them were built on the river because they used water in their processes, but some of them were just built in neighborhoods. At the beginning of the 19th century, Providence was a small town built around the great salt cove where you could still fish and dig mussels. By the end of the century, Providence was one of the richest cities in the country with a diversified economy. Downtown is a response to wealth, and, and Providence started getting rich in the late 18th century. Downtown occurred because once you establish industry, you need to have um, management for, for the industry, and with that you need, you need insurance, and you need banking, and all of these people need to be in close contact with one another. There was no telephone, there was no telegraph. There was no, you, had, you had to be next door to somebody who, who insured you and paid your bills and that sort of thing. So that's what created downtown. In the 19th century, transportation became critical in creating a central city. And of course, when, once you have a, a central city uh, in the 19th century, that's when all, as transportation develops, that's where everybody wants to have come. So the train has to come through there. And then once you have streetcars, they all have to converge there. So, so it becomes a, a, a critical mass. The mercantile economy with profits from shipping to the Caribbean and China, gave way during the Industrial Revolution to a new economy, manufacturing. The buildings that housed this activity were first built of wood and stone, but then they changed to brick, grand block-long castles with loads of windows, some of the most enduring vestiges of the city's wealth and power. The money that was so necessary in creating the Industrial Revolution is coming out of our merchant background. The people who amass their wealth are taking that, investing into industrial spaces. The industrial economy and, and the ability to play a financial role in it and a commercial role in it really boosted Providence um, dramatically. It was home to some of the largest manufacturers of its kind in the world, including Brown and Sharp with machine tools, American Screw, the production of screws. We had Gorham, the largest silver uh, company in the world. And the textile uh, operations, the worsted operations here, were all leaders in their field as well. Providence was incredibly fortunate in that the peaks of its prosperity coincided with great periods in American architecture. For 100 years, from the early 19th century to the early 20th century, Providence could afford to build the structures that the country's best architects would draw. Downtown Providence is this really unique ensemble of buildings whose styles stretch from the colonial period uh, right through the late 20th century and even into the 21st century. Uh, it's really a densely packed area filled with numerous prime examples of styles and of architects' work. Buildings work together and, and you see it in what I think of as the best parts of Providence. You see it with buildings that are different in scale, in massing, in function, but they all sort of work together. You saw a dedication to the, an idea that beauty matters, that functionality in and of itself is, is not enough to inspire, and that design plays a role in every aspect of your life and your work. And we see that in Providence in every street that you walk down. So when you step into a city like Providence, you, you feel that you are actually in a real place that, uh, that shows levels of history. And you have buildings from uh, 1820 
the nationally famous Providence Arcade of 1828 is right next to another equally important and impressive building nationally, the Industrial Trust Tower um, of 1928. So 100 years of history of the best architecture in the country uh, and right next door to each other on a street in Providence, Rhode Island. Those buildings were not ornate just for the sake of being ornate. They were communicating to people of that period that, uh, that there was wealth here. One of the great enduring buildings from that period is Market House. When the Market House was built, it was literally that. It was the market. It was the place where business was conducted, where things were sold, where everyone got together, where people met. And um, I presume that it was open at the bottom, the, where the windows are now, it was open so that market stalls could be put there in bad weather. This building is not so much important as an architectural style. It's your basic Georgian, somewhat expanded domestic style, but it's important as a survivor. It's for 250 years, it's one of the only market houses of its type that still survives. Maybe Boston, maybe Philadelphia, but this was the, the heart of the city. And if you, if you see photographs of Providence over the years, this is always at the, the sort of the eye, the crossroads, the crux, the, the coffee house, the meeting place, everything, the most important civic building in Providence for most of its history. But a simple brick market house could no longer serve as a center of a city that was becoming a powerhouse of industry, banking, and transportation. Nothing announced this transition more dramatically than the shift of the mercantile focus of the city from the simple brick market house at the foot of College Hill to a radical new building across the river, the Arcade. If you look down Westminster Street, you immediately see on your left one of the most touching monuments in American architecture history. It's an arcade, a glass-covered shopping arcade that crosses between Westminster and Waybosset Street and was built in 1828. It is widely considered to be the oldest enclosed shopping mall in, in America. The, the Italians and the, the British had, had toyed with this model before, a series of shops, uh, uh, skylit. Um, an enclosed street. In Paris, they had begun around 1802, and they were the sites of modernity, almost symbols of modernity. You had steel and glass in the roof. You had gas lights. That's where the gas light starts in Paris. You had a dry pavement, which was unusual at the time. And, of course, you had all this mix of shops, and it meant people would mix there. Social classes would mix. And that's such an exciting experiment, and people here in Providence picked that up and built one. Another example of how solidly the focus of Providence has shifted to the west in the 19th century is the old Custom House. We're in front of what was the United States Customs House in Providence in the middle of 19th century. It served as the federal courts, it served as the Steamship Commission, it served just about everything for the federal government in Providence. It may not be the most important building in downtown Providence, but it's certainly one of the most beautiful. A really clear, crisp example of a kind of um, Renaissance mercantile palazzo. It'd be like something lifted from the streets of, of Florence. It's made out of Quincy granite. It seemed to be really much better than brick. It seemed more solid. It seemed more public. And I've always had a special um, feeling for the architect of this building. It's a man named M. I. B. Young, and he was a native of New Hampshire. And he became the first supervising architect of the U.S. Treasury, which meant that for a dozen years in the 1850s, he designed every public federal building in the United States. Every courthouse, every customs house, every post office, all of it. He sort of developed a technique to make sure that nobody would even think of not paying their uh, customs. And he built these uh, federal custom houses, always out of granite, and with very, very precise, tight joints. I love that. If you go close and you bring a little knife, you can't even get your knife into that little joint. And that's very symbolic, meaning, you know, this is the federal force and you better not mess with us. This is solid and it's a great uh, building and I love looking at it. It's, it's a wonderful structure. 
It's a solid block of granite with cutouts for windows uh, and these arches. And if you look around the building, you notice that the walls are absolutely smooth except for those coins, those cornering devices that make it seem more solid. It's, it's a very elegant, low-key, solid building. It says government, it says mercantile, it says commerce. Remember that Providence in the 1850s is a great port. The Old Stone Bank is a very good building to talk about periods of architecture, and not just a single period, but a, a number of periods. It was built in, originally in the 1850s, pre-Civil War, and it really looked to me, when I look at the old photographs of it, as a sort of dense, uh, very sturdy granite vault. It was much more compact than it is today. Uh, it used uh, the same kinds of big granite blocks, uh, sort of impenetrable. You want to leave your money here and it's not going to go anywhere and no one's going to get to it. One of the interesting things about a lot of uh, 19th century buildings is that is that the interiors are relatively dark in terms of our taste today but that's not the case with the old stone bank building and that is when you walk into that space you go through a small compressed area of the heavy doors and the big granite walls but then you enter into this sort of open space very airy i mean in a way unexpected even though the dome is outside you still don't quite expect that uh, as you're entering into the space and it opens up in front of you uh, and above you really uh, like a uh, many people compare it to the pantheon that that sort of that sense of sort of uh, a celestial opening up of space and a lot of light in that space which i think to me is a surprise when you look at the exterior of the building which is so massive and blocky and and meant to be uh, convey a sense of of opacity <laughs> and then you walk into the space and suddenly you're in a very human type space and that's where as you know underneath the dome all the sort of business of the the daily business of, of people going in and depositing their money and getting their money out occurred. During the 19th century Providence began to build a treasure house of architectural gems. The Atlantic Bank on Way Bossett Street was founded in 1853 but only lasted 60 years when its demise was caused by the bank president misappropriating funds. The Turk's Head building stands where Waybosset and Westminster Streets come together and takes its name from the large Turk's Head built into the facade. The Union Trust looks like a skyscraper due to its slender massing. The figures of an Indian and pilgrim above the main entrance are reminiscent of Michelangelo's Medici tombs figures. The building is exquisite in its design. The Industrial Trust Tower, sometimes referred to as the Superman Building, was at one time the tallest building in New England. The Union train station we see today was built after the original Union Station burnt down across the street from the current location. It took its name from the fact that it was the place where the tracks came together from other major metropolitan areas in the Northeast. Jeweler Duty Wilcox had this building that bears his name built as a monument to his success. The Merchant Bank once stood as the city's tallest for over two decades. Providence City Hall, which was almost lost in the middle of the last century, is now one of the country's best-preserved government buildings. The city's most treasured gem sits at the top of Smith Hill. I think placement of buildings on the land is, is, is absolutely critical. And we are sitting and standing right now in one of the most um, important examples of that, and that's the Rhode Island State House. You can't come to Providence without knowing that this is the capital. It is one of the best buildings in Rhode Island and it's beautifully sited and it defines the city. It really makes this, this is capital city to me. If you look at this building, you look at this building, you know exactly what's going on in it. You know that under that dome is circulation space. 
And because there are shallow domes over the east and west wings, you understand that those are the legislative chambers. You can read this building from the outside and understand exactly what's going on. The State House was built where it was, uh, not just arbitrarily, but it was built there because it was really the nexus of, of the water power that made Providence great, the railroads that made Providence great, and it was sort of on a rise that, that, you could, that it would have a prominence. Uh, so they, they, they took into account natural features that meant something to Providence. We're at the Providence County Courthouse. This building was designed in 1924 and built through the rest of the, until the early 30s and the depression came in the meantime, but in 1925 was the 150th anniversary of the signing, or 1926, of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And there was a kind of a big patriotic hoopla and this building is, really hooks into that patriotism. It looks very American, although I think a lot of the details are quite English, but that's neither here nor there. If you look at the tower, you can see certain references to uh, Independence Hall. There are a lot of other buildings at this time that were built that look like Independence Hall, if you know Reader's Digest in Pleasantville, New York. Or Anyway, there were a, lo a lot of these. And, um, but the problem with an Independence Hall and the problem that you had with the market house we talked about is that Georgian architecture is basically domestic. It's basically small. It's a, a series of small um, decorative elements added to, say, a cube or a block. But here, we have a massive building, a building that could, be, I don't know what the square footage of this is, but it's a massive building. And what the architects very cleverly did is they broke it down into a series of smaller houses. And the only large um, facade is that uh, right across the front, but it is broken up by the wonderful colonnade below in this space that really is not American at all. It looks like something would be in Paris on the Rue de Rivoli or the Champs-Élysées, uh, something at Versailles. It's this colonnade is so dramatic, uh, also ro romantic, and it really works. It's a sense of a real public building, but it doesn't hit you over the head. It's also this, this long um, corridor acts as a, as a sort of breathing space between the street and then this courtyard before you go in to the main entrance of the building. And then they put it together climbing the hill. And that's the great thing about this building. And this sort of goes back and back and back. So a lot of those, what would otherwise would be large blank surfaces are mitigated by having them climb the hill, by having these little breakups of the, of the units. They've done a terrific job. All those little elements, um, the, the, the balconies, the balustrades, um, the coining, the, the various windows. You notice that there's a, a ventilator there and then there's a window and then there's another window and then there's another window and then there's a clock and then there's a cupola. It's all a kind of series of, of like giant Russian dolls coming out of the, the large one. One of the ironies of this tremendous growth to success was just as Providence reached its peak, there were actually clear signals in retrospect that fatal flaws had developed in the economy that had boosted it so far. The infrastructure aged. Textile production moved to the south. There was labor unrest. Steadily, Providence settled into a slow decline. The city became a shell of itself. The final blow was introducing into the fabric of the city, into its very heart, the virus that would almost destroy it, the automobile. A few highways had been built in the 1930s, but in the 50s it really begins to become a national program. So when the road system was put in, it changed the way we lived, because the automobile became more and more uh, customary to be used in, in American life. Originally the idea was to have the highways go around the, the, the city core, right? but then it, it, it was more convenient in a way to actually uh, cut them right through the, uh, the, the center uh, of the cities. The automobile has done more to destroy American cities than anything else, and we still have that, that problem. 
as a result of the automobile, people would move to the suburbs and suddenly there wasn't enough tax income in the center of the cities. At the same time, urban planning in the United States was seized by the idea of urban renewal. Urban renewal was premised on the fact that old was not good. Urban renewal was premised on the fact that you blame things on the buildings. If the building um, was old and tired, had had a lot of users, a lot of owners, and had been badly treated or just worn out, that you needed to replace it with new. Other cities around New England and around the Northeast were going through the same experience we were going through. Um, you know, metamorphosis, change, they knocked everything down. We decided to save our buildings. And I always thought the future of our city had a lot to do with our past. Providence escaped the worst of urban renewal, but the city was still hollowed out. If you looked at the downtown in those days, you could roll a, a bowling ball down Westminster Street and you wouldn't hit anybody after six o'clock. And, uh, and, and of course, the neighborhoods were deteriorating and the city wasn't really spending a lot of money on infrastructure. The Biltmore Hotel, and the day I got inaugurated, they were taking the piano out of the Biltmore Hotel. And I was one at the time who felt that the city may just die. The urban renewal days were over with in terms of availability of major federal funds. The initiatives on Wabasset Hill, South Main, model cities here in the periphery of the downtown, they had been fully funded. There was no dollars still left for downtown. The sequence of those things that gave life to the city were going dark. Um, and it, it had a psychological, negative psychological impact to the point where people would turn around and say, hey, there's no, no life here. There's no chance that we can bring this back. So the general sense in, is, was of somewhat desperation. What can we do? No one can pinpoint the exact day or time or place, but it was during this period of time that the tide started to shift for the city of Providence. I'd watched other New England cities, Rust Belt cities, struggle with revitalization, policy, planning, infrastructure, trying to reinvent themselves economically, and failing very badly. And in Providence, there seemed to be the seeds of something rather different and rather special. I think that if you had mentioned the city of Providence as a case study of Renaissance or a potential case study of urban rena Renaissance in the United States 20 years before, you'd have been laughed out of whatever forum you happened to be speaking in. And I think by that time, people were beginning to talk about a renaissance and a renaissance city um, without a sneer, but rather with some genuine optimism. What made the difference? It was a long and painful process, but in Providence, there was a remarkable confluence of people and programs. If you had intelligent people at the right time from all different sectors, public, private, and nonprofit, at all levels of government, federal, state, and local, coming together, recognizing a crisis at a very pivotal moment, which we can probably trace to the mid to late 1970s, saying, you know, we need to look back to what this city was, what it could be, and think very seriously for the first time together how we can take the best elements of this city and try and find the glue that will put them back together again. The revitalization of the city, the renaissance of today's Providence, depended on solving a series of separate but interlocking problems, each of which would generate a major public works project before the process could move forward. Crucial to any plan to revitalize downtown was the spaghetti snarl of train tracks and parking lots that dominated the center of the city. 
step one was uh, the relocation of the railroads, and the uh, prime mover behind this project was an individual uh, by the name of Ron Marcella. We initiated, we being the city, planning agencies, the state, and mostly in the Department of Transportation, and the Province Foundation initiated studies to see what could happen to the old railroad station. The idea was how do we uh, redevelop that train station, bridge the railroad tracks so that we could incorporate all that, what was parking lots on the north side of the railroad tracks up to the State House, incorporated into downtown. And one of the things I looked at was the old 1960 master plan. And its fundamental premise was you relocated the tracks to the State House lawn. What is the downtown master plan proposal for location of the railroad station? Well, first, the former Henry Barnard School would be the location. Second, the tracks would curve about the base of the State House Hill, paralleling Gaspe Street. So when I looked at the plan, old plan, I said, geez, is it worth taking another look at this? Because once the federal government spent the money in place in the old configuration of railroad tracks, we wouldn't get another opportunity in anyone's lifetime. So the looked like there wasn't a financial problem to do this. The real question was legal issues. Uh, the land, who owned the land in the uh, proposed new alignment. It's about the same period of time, the Federal Highway Administration agreed to abandon the I-84 project, which was supposed to connect Providence to Hartford. And the federal government not only abandoned the project, they said to the state, you can reallocate these federal funds and use them with a great deal of flexibility, not just for interstate work, but for local roads tied in with the interstate. Now this was absolutely key because it provided a pool of funds to build the interchange and all the roads in Capitol Center. Suddenly Rhode Island had a huge amount of money available from the federal government to do things. Uh, but then we had to talk them into moving the rivers. And so the money was coming for the Federal Highway Administration, it was for transportation projects, it wasn't for beautifying uh, or develop, developing downtown areas. So there was a thing called Suicide Circle and it was a constant source of problems. So we went to the federal government, we said we need to get rid of Suicide Circle. In order to do it, we need to move the rivers and they sort of laughed at us. Uh, but we managed to get uh, the head of the Federal Highway Administration to come and visit uh, Providence. Uh, we took him downtown and showed him this horrible circle and uh, he sort of said tongue in cheek, and the only way you can cure this is to move rivers. <laughs> and I said, that's the only way, sir. <laughs> and eventually he approved the project. The two rivers that converged in the heart of downtown Providence presented a special problem. Step two was the relocation of the rivers. Unfortunately, over the years, the rivers became polluted, and the confluence of the rivers became a health hazard. So the city and state leaders and the business community decided that the most appropriate solution was to channelize the rivers and pave them over. That would also create some new real estate that would allow them to expand economic opportunity for the city, or so they thought. We have a confluence of two rivers in, in downtown Providence. And for over 70 years, I believe, uh, those rivers were covered with bridges, so much so that people were unaware that there were rivers underneath. As a matter of fact, it was understood that Providence is home to the widest bridge in the world. And the relocation came about because some of the rivers were under buildings. And there were buildings that could not be removed, like the post office downtown. In the 1970s, a study was done to reimagine downtown Providence. The Interface Project, as it was called, was led by Rhode Island School of Design professor Gerald Howe and his students. It was one of the first attempts at creating a new master plan. 
part of the process by which one plan folded into another plan folded into another, while they appeared to be shelved, but small elements of these plans being preserved and picked up by subsequent researchers and planners and practitioners, I think is interface providence, which is a very beautiful and elegant example of what started out as a design study under Gerald Howe at uh, the Rhode Island School of Design and his students, um, called for a number of the changes that in fact were implemented much later on. There were two highlights to his master plan. One was exactly the study of how to create an intermodal transportation network, a nodal point in Providence. He um, also envisioned the return of the rivers uh, that were uh, buried at that time uh, underneath uh, the city. When I became mayor, we began to talk about making Providence a walking city. And he was responsible for educating me and, and, tr and for me to be a cheerleader for it and be a, a proponent of it. It was a great conceptual project. It was the first real broaching of opening the rivers up versus closing them. The most daring planners began to see that to rescue the rivers that flowed through the city, to open them up again to the sun, they too might have to be moved. The guiding spirit of moving the waters was architect Bill Warner. And that kind of was the beginning of our friendship. And we began to meet on Thursdays uh, after class. I mean, those of us who were uh, teaching. And it was one of, in one of these nights when all of a sudden we came to talk about the future of Providence. And so we began to sketch on a linen napkin our ideas about what Providence should do uh, for the future. And, you know, there's a drawing by Bill Warner, there's a drawing by uh, Irving Haynes, and a drawing by myself. And um, when we were too tired to go any further, we, we pour a glass of red wine over it to seal it, right? It was like, uh, it was like the seal for it. And of course, it diluted the ink and it became actually kind of like almost like a work of art. The extraordinary thing about Providence in the last 20 to 25 years is that almost through happenstance, you had unique, forceful, influential individuals. But a common interest brought these people together uh, to work on solving the economic crisis uh, of a city in incipient and what appeared to be irreversible decline. There are all kinds of people who could have said no, who could have said it's too difficult, it's too much money, it's going to take too long, it's going to interfere with moving the railroad tracks. You know, starting with Governor Gary, he, he was, became a big supporter. I remember going and showing him the plans that Bill Warner had. He supported it immediately. You know, if he had been the least bit uh, negative about it, wouldn't have gone forward. Among the visionaries designing and leading the city's new phase, Bill Warner stood taller than most. And he came up with the plan that we now see, which required the relocation of the rivers. Warner believed that changing the course of the rivers would open up new and unexpected areas of excitement. He had vision like you can't believe, and that's the guy we really should credit for the idea of what we see down there today. Imagine the voice necessary, the, the persuasion uh, that went into the arguments to bring along a mayor, a governor, state senators and representatives, U.S. senators and U.S. representatives, to back that, not only to back it conceptually, but to fund it. Warner, Bill Warner, was in a sense Rhode Island's first political architect. So when you walk around river relocation and uh, along the rivers and the bridges, you see Bill everywhere. That's Bill. That's Bill. By the time you had the rivers relocated and, uh, the, uh, and the railroads relocated, a substantial uh, uh, amount of land um, uh, now became available for development, and that then became um, the capital center. Taking that freed up space and not only making it into new, viable real estate, 
that would now be linking the downtown and Smith Hill, but also including in it some great public urban spaces. So that it's, it's not just a real estate development project, it's not just a, an urban renewal project, it's something that can become more organic and start to tie pieces of the city together in a way that they really hadn't been before. One of the most influential voices was that of lifelong preservationist Antoinette Downey. One of the first things we did, we made sure she was on the Capital Center Commission. She was vice chairperson of the Capital Center Commission so that she had a direct, she was at the table. And then she understood that the, um, any new development around the state capitol had to honor the beauty and history and importance of that building. And so she fought for low-rise buildings, which is always going to be a, a, a hard-won battle in, in American society. Um, and she fought very hard for there to be sort of a park-like setting around that building. One of the things she was concerned about were view corridors, how you look towards something, particularly the State House, for example, from downtown Providence, and she helped maintain the view corridor, which is still there, from downtown Providence toward the State House. As much as she was a preservationist, she saw this undeveloped property between the State House and downtown, and she knew something was going to happen there. You know, because we're Americans, we love tall buildings. And uh, the first thing that anyone thinks when they're given a development parcel is, how can we build the tallest building on it? And, and that race to build tall has uh, ennobled and um, uh, made exciting fantastic cities like Boston and New York and even Providence. The development guidelines restricted height such that the only high building would be where Citizens now is, and the others were to be low, six stories or less. That's changed. Um, the, the guidelines were changed, and uh, taller buildings have been built there. Cities, I think one of the definitions of cities I read somewhere is that these are spaces that are always changing. I mean, they're, they're, nothing is static in a city, and I think s static places become museums, uh, or are museums. Uh, they, become, they become deadened, really, to, to sort of everyday life. And I guess I want to reject the idea that you can't have good modern or good contemporary architecture in uh, urban spaces, at least. Uh, sometimes I think people are looking too much at the details of a building, whether something quotes something from the past, for example, rather than looking at other broader aspects of design, like the massing of a building or how it sits on the street, the materials that are used. Uh, some of those things can be as important. And I think the best preservationists, again, I keep mentioning Antoinette Downing, but a whole host of others, uh, really realize that. It's really about the way the building resides in its space as much as it is about whether it quotes from the Karadzic Monument in Greece or the Pantheon. And I think the best architecture today still does that. It might make a respectful kind of uh, a view corridor towards something that people still love in Providence, as opposed to blocking a view. Bill Warner had a wonderful quote. Uh, the, the highway was in the way, so I just said, let, let, let's move it. Let, let's get it out of the way. Phase four then became the relocation of Interstate 195. People like Bill Warner and Robert Freeman at the Providence Foundation looked downstream and saw one of those mistakes of the early interstate period, which is sending an interstate right through the heart of a city. And there's 195 snaking right across, cutting off in a lot of ways the, the downtown from the east side when it could be linking it. And the idea of moving 195 in the same way that the rail line got moved all of a sudden became this idea that got its momentum. DOT liked the idea that you can build a new right-of-way without um, affecting existing right-of-way and impacting traffic for five or seven years. Um, Jewelry District people loved it because it would connect to um, the downtown. Uh, city officials liked it because once Capital Center was filled, you were out of land to put new development in. So all of a sudden you had 20 plus acres of development land. And now we are at the beginning of the development of the vacant land that is now be that became available with the relocation of 195. Uh, Providence is no longer 
a financial center that it was or, or, um, or an industrial center that it was. Right? Uh, the banks have all gone. I mean, you know, the headquarters are all gone and they will never come back. Right? Yeah? But we have all of a sudden this influx of, of, of these universities into town. But I think that's the future. I think the future of Providence is to be a college town. The young people want to live in this kind of environment today. Downtown urban environments or, you know, where there's density of people and where they meet each other and, and interact. And, um, but it's also, from an environmental point of view, it is, we're re recycling these buildings that were built beautifully in, over a 30 or 40 year period in the late 19th, early 20th century. And so from an environmental point of view, in terms of reuse, repurposing buildings, it's absolutely the right thing to do. So it was really kind of getting back into the soul, of the soul of the city, soul of people, of placing. This is the downtown for a million people. So it, it, it actually is about thinking about social interaction. So people come together. It's, uh, how does a street work? How does a sidewalk work that encourages that type of thing to happen? In Providence, you have the opportunity to understand what it's like to be in a wonderful human-scaled urban environment, a place you can walk through and feel really comfortable with. We had the buildings because we have a, such a, uh, we had a, a, a preservation society in Providence that was formed in the middle 50s that, that made preservation a strong movement here. And so, and also because of a weak economy during that area, there wasn't a big demand to tear those buildings down. So the urban fabric was largely in place. The question was, was what was going to be the, what were going to be the new uses for this? And so we had uh, learned from our previous work that actually using those buildings and transforming them into a mixture of uses, including residential, uh, retail on the first floor, and workspaces, uh, was the way to do it with the re with the residential leading. And uh, so. You know, so when you have a mixture of uses, that, that, that's really a, what, a, what a neighborhood is. One of the most exciting things I think that's happened downtown Providence is, th is that they found uh, a kind of readaptive use or a mixed use for the arcade building, one of the most important buildings in downtown Providence, at least in historical terms. Uh, it, it, they are going to keep some co uh, commercial uh, interest in the building, uh, but then they're going to design on the top two floors what they're calling micro lofts, uh, very small spaces, but very well designed, uh, small small spaces, uh, residential spaces, uh, and it's just what I think uh, cities need today is they need to attract younger people w with affordable housing uh, and younger people maybe who have a different lifestyle than people who want very large-scale suburban type homes uh, and and that's a terrific reuse which will keep that building alive and going and maintained for, for hopefully for many generations to come. The last few years have seen the conversion of the city's magisterial brick factories and the imaginative reuse of historical buildings of every stripe. One of the things that struck me when I first came to Providence in 1985, um, notwithstanding the immediate sort of visceral response to decline that had obviously been going on for many decades, uh, was this uh, high-quality uh, residential and commercial infrastructure, the legacy in the buildings, the colonial architecture, the federalist architecture, and I think above all, the industrial architecture, the great mills and the manufacturing buildings. And I think what pleases me as much as anything else is how sensibly um, these buildings have been adaptively reused. Um, over the last 15 years or so. And um, here we are sitting in front of the Imperial Knife building, offices, residences, restaurants, small stores. Um, who would have thought that this jewelry district uh, would in fact become a growth node for the city? So this is another example, I think, of how the pieces eventually fit together. We've got a whole bunch of very important, historically important buildings in downtown Providence, which right now are struggling to find that readaptive use. The iconic South Street Power Station has been transformed into South Street Landing, 
a state-of-the-art educational facility for area colleges and universities. Across the river, the Old Stone Bank building is now a personal residence. And maybe the most important architecturally of them all is the uh, Industrial Trust Building, the so-called Superman Building. We've got to find some, some good use. Use and function uh, usually precedes maintenance and preservation. Water is something that we have come to appreciate and realize that it's really part of our history. And it's one of the wonderful things about recreating that little cove down here at the foot of the State House, in creating River Walk along the uh, Providence River. And one of the things that I think is important is what we've done to recreate that. But if it made sense at one point to cover the rivers, it took an artist to see that uncovering them presented an amazing opportunity. In 1994, Barnaby Evans created what he thought would be a one-off performance piece, Water Fire. This combination of fire and water and music draws hundreds of thousands of visitors to the once moribund downtown. Providence was a city that needed a rebirth. It needed re-engagement and re-excitement. And there'd been so many great ideas that people had brought to the city. Um, one of the most brilliant was the work of moving the river, which was the result of uh, the late Bill Warner and Friedrich San Florian and others had this great conversation. And, and Bill Warner had the, the tenacity and the um, engagement to sort of bring this community into a heroic period of rebuilding, of really envisioning a magnificent future for downtown. I have a theory that good architecture doesn't make things happen but good architecture and planning lets things happen. We didn't know about water fire. We had no idea about water fire, but um, we wanted to create a stage for people to enjoy the city. And we did, and Barnaby saw the opportunity, and uh, good architecture and planning allows great things to happen. And we built this park, and it was, it was there, it was winning design awards, but your next, the next step of a park is you've got to get people to own it, to believe in it, to fill it with life, to fill it with people. We're deliberately looking at statements of rebirth, of renaissance, of the, the rise of the phoenix from the ashes, this resurgent sense of possibility and engagement. Um, those motifs are, are um, sort of placed throughout Waterfire itself. In the 1970s, a freshman at Brown University wrote home in dismay. I am here in a rotting New England port city. No one could call it that today. have the bones of a great city here that w was a great city and I think if we can pay attention to restoring it it's really like restoring our heart our spirit that that will have a, a profound impact on retaining our children and our grandchildren and attracting the new economy that's that's needed in order to, to retain those kids I don't know of any any city anywhere in the world where uh, a city undertook to uh, relocate its railroads, uh, relocate its rivers, uh, relocate its highways, and all of this has been done here in Providence. These rivers and everything that surrounds them remain as a tribute to all those whose hands have shaped this canvas and played a part in the recreation of Divine Providence.
Funding for this program provided by 